Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. In his first inaugural address, President Reagan declared, above all, we must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. More than 40 years later, the men and women of Ukraine have proven how right he is. Their courage and resolve have been extraordinary and indeed the most formidable weapon in their arsenal. But if there's a second most important item in that arsenal, it's the intelligence capabilities and emerging technologies that have allowed them to stand up to what the world long considered a great military power. That intel and technology, so much of it provided by the United States, has allowed them to flip the script and it's made us rethink the wars will be fought in the future. That is why it's so meaningful that for the very first time, we're joined here at the Reagan National Defense Forum by a sitting director of national intelligence. Director Avril Haines has earned a stellar reputation of bipartisan collaboration and deep expertise. Many of you worked with her when she served as deputy director at the CIA and the principal deputy national security advisor during the Obama administration. And the agencies she now oversees have been the consequential players as the free world counters Russian aggression. In the days leading up to Putin's vicious assault on democracy, the United States intelligence community over and over accurately and precisely predicted his every move and revealed his intentions. That public use of intelligence exposed false flag operations. It built trust in America's warnings. It united our allies and it gave the Ukrainians greater time to prepare. This is the first war in which, we have, which, in which we've seen intelligence leveraged in this way, thanks to the technology that, that was not even available 10 to 20 years ago. The public use of intelligence has undermined the adversary's plots, destroyed and continues to destroy the Russians' narratives, and helped the Ukrainians fight for their freedom. So let us all thank the intelligence community for their stellar work, not just in Ukraine, not just for what we know and see, but also for the many unseen ways that they keep us safe every day. <clears throat> Leading today's fireside chat with Director Haynes is a veteran correspondent respected by so many in the national security community, Andrea Mitchell, the chief foreign affairs correspondent for NBC News. Her career dates back to the Reagan administration when she covered the White House, including traveling with President Reagan to his arms control summits with the late Mikhail Gorbachev. Please join me now in welcoming Andrea, Andrea Mitchell and the seventh director of national intelligence and also the very first woman to lead the United States intelligence community, Avril Haines. Thank you so much, and thanks to all of you. It is such a privilege to be back here at the Reagan Library and Foundation and to see so many of my friends uh, from past administrations and past Congresses and Senate, and to most particularly be here with Ariel Haynes, uh, the seventh director of national intelligence and the first woman. So thank you so much for your service, oh. and thanks for being with us here today. Thank you for doing this, and let me just say thank you so much for inviting me, honestly, and for the lovely introduction, but I will relay the thanks to the intelligence community. And I just, I'm uh, deeply grateful, frankly, for what all of you do in the defense industry and across the community to actually support us in many respects, so thank you. For and I did want to begin with Ukraine, uh, about the capacity that Ukraine now has, having retaken Kherson, uh, is, do they have the capacity for a counteroffensive to even approach Crimea and try to break that land bridge? 
Yeah, I think, so as we're looking at the trajectory of the conflict, kind of going through the next several months, Honestly, we're seeing a kind of a reduced tempo already of the conflict. Most of the fighting right now is around Bakhmut and the Donetsk area and, uh, and sort of has slowed down with the withdrawal of, um, of Russia from the sort of western Kherson uh, area to the um, east of the river. And, and we expect that's likely to be what we see in the coming months. And then once you get past the winter, the sort of question is, what will the counteroffensive look like potentially in the spring, in effect, in March and in that area? And we expect that, frankly, both militaries are going to be in a situation where they're going to be looking to try to refit, resupply, in a sense, reconstitute so that they're kind of prepared for that counteroffensive, but we actually have a fair amount of skepticism as to whether or not the Russians will be, in fact, prepared to do that. And I think, yeah, I think more optimistically for the Ukrainians in that time frame. To that point, to what extent is Putin getting real information about the war and about the reverses they've suffered? Yeah, I mean, this has obviously been an issue that's been discussed pretty widely. And I, I think um, what I can say is that I think Putin was surprised by his military's sort of uh, lack of performance and the fact that they did not accomplish more. That's, I'm sure, no surprise to anybody here. I do think he is becoming more informed of the challenges that the military faces in Russia, but it's still not clear to us that he has a full picture at this stage of just how challenged they are. And I mean, we see shortages of ammunition, poor morale, supply issues, logistics, a whole series of concerns that they're facing. You said in June that he had not changed his objective to retake Ukraine. Do you think that's changed at all? Yeah, what we say is that he has not changed his political objectives, and at least we don't see evidence of that. And in effect, I think, you know, as we look at it, you know, when when you say his objective to retake Ukraine, I think there are a lot of interpretations of what that means. And so, you know, his political objective is effectively to control it. He doesn't see Ukraine, and of course he says this publicly on a pretty regular basis, as a separate country. He sees it as part of, in effect, uh, his, you know, um, sovereign uh, national um, ambit. And, and I think the, the challenge is, what does that mean for his near-term military objectives? Are they gonna be as expansive as they were at the beginning, or does he at some point recognize that he's incapable of doing what it is he intended to originally, and sort of downscale what it is that he's willing to accept for now? I think our analysts would say, you know, he may be willing to do that on a temporary basis with the idea that he might then come back at this issue at a later time. How debilitating is the destruction of the power grid in terms of Ukraine's ability to not just get through the winter because it's a humanitarian disaster already, yeah. but to sustain its military? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think this is obviously, um, you know, we in the intelligence community spend a lot of time looking at the analysis of these issues. It is sometimes hard in the morning as you're reading the intelligence to sort of separate it out from the tragedy of what's happening every day. And I, I think, you know, as we, watch these, uh, you know, the population fight for their country and then see the just outrageous illegal attack on civilian infrastructure such as the grid. And it's not just the grid, right? It's gas, it's heating, it's a variety of other things that they're going after. I think our, you know, in part, they're doing this in order to undermine the Ukrainian will, in effect. And I think we're not seeing any evidence of that being undermined right now at this point. Um, they are also looking potentially to affect Ukraine's capacity to you know, prosecute the conflict. And it, it can, over time, obviously, have an impact. How much of an impact will be dependent on how much they go after what they're capable of doing, the resilience of that critical infrastructure, our capacity to help them defend it in many respects. And then I think also there's the economic aspect of this. I mean, Ukraine's economy is suffering very badly, it's been devastating. And I think, you know, obviously taking down the grid will have an impact on that as well. How quickly is Russia burning through its military stockpiles of munition? I think I can give you precise numbers in this forum, but, uh, but quite quickly. I mean, it's really pretty extraordinary. And our own 
sense is that they are not capable of indigenously producing what they are expending at this stage. So uh, that is going to be a challenge, and that's why you see them going to other countries effectively to try to get ammunition. And of course, you know, we've uh, indicated that their precision munitions are running out much faster in many respects. They have a lot of stockpiles. How viable those stockpiles are, how much they have, what they can use in different conflicts are obviously all questions that we look at quite carefully with our allies and partners. How much are they relying on North Korea for relying their artillery? I mean, we've indicated we've seen some movement, but it's not been a lot at this stage, and it is one of the ones that we're watching quite carefully because it would be significant, potentially. And the Iranian drones, which yeah. have been so effective in taking out the substations, so they don't have to use their advanced weaponry to take out power plants as long as they can interrupt the grid. Yeah. Um, do, you, do we also see evidence? Uh, there have been reports that Iranians are on the ground. Are they on the ground helping them to uh, actually manufacture these drones? What I, I can say is that we've obviously seen them give UAVs, and they tried. The Iranian regime first denied it. Then they said, well, these were given before the war. <laughs> you know, they had a variety of different excuses for it. I think We've also seen the Russians looking for other types of precision munitions from Iran, and that will be very concerning in terms of their capacity more generally, but it's probably as much as I can do. Director Burns told me in July that Russia had suffered about 15,000 casualties. Um, are, is, are there losses at that, continuing at that pace? Can you give us some estimate? I won't do estimates, but I'll, I'll say that you know right now what we're seeing, as I mentioned, is kind of a reduced tempo, so we're not seeing just as many casualties as we have in the prior weeks and months. Is there any evidence that China is supplying any material support other than buying their oil? China continues to play sort of both sides of this game, right? I mean, they are continuing to work with Russia on a variety of things. They continue to do things like um, you know, have meetings, find ways to support them in international fora to help them manage, you know, efforts to expose what the Russians are doing or provide condemnation. Um, and they are providing different forms of assistance. We have not indicated publicly we don't see anything that is uh, determinative of military assistance. But, um, but there are things on the margins of that that, you know, concern us and we'll obviously keep watching this. It does appear that Russia, that Putin has tamped down the nuclear threats recently. Is there any evidence that China was instrumental in that? No, but I think it is fair to say from our perspective that Xi's voice on this is going to be obviously among the most compelling to Putin on this issue. And so the fact that he came out and indicated as he did you know, in the G7, it's, it, that was important and I think that's likely to have been um, something that's important to Putin. There's been you know, reference just here now to the extraordinary um, steps that the intelligence community took to declassify in the days before the war with our allies and notably in the early days stages of the war. Um, how much of a tactical advantage do you think that gave us? And is this a lesson to continue to declassify intelligence um, to sort of gain gain leverage over an adversary. Yeah, well, I'll tell you how it developed a little bit because I think it's important to just understanding how we were thinking about it and, um, and, and also tell you that it really was an extraordinary team effort. I mean, you know, leaders like General Nakasone, who's here today as well, and others, Bill, and just across the community were a part of, of making it happen the way we did and, uh, and this has been one of the joys of frankly sitting in my seat, which is that I get to see how the community can work together to actually um, produce what we've been able to produce in the context of this conflict and you know, have a rare opportunity, honestly, for the world to see a little bit of what we do because often when we're doing this, we don't have a chance to you know, expose it as Director Panetta knows and others who have been leading our intelligence community in the past. But, um, but what happened was essentially we were obviously starting to provide intelligence to our policy community, to the president and so on, that indicated we were increasingly concerned about the fact that Putin appeared to be developing an option, a military option to do a large scale invasion in Ukraine. And, uh, and as we saw that, you know, I think 
as anybody under the circumstances would be, you know, there was a fair amount of skepticism even in our own policy community. Are you sure? Like, does this really make sense? Why would he do this? What are the options? You know, how is this going to develop? And, you know, and we increasingly were putting intelligence on the table to say, no, we really think this is something that that is real. And uh, and then, you know, the president sort of said, okay, well we need to start talking to our partners and allies about this. What will we do? How can we, you know, is there any opportunity for deterrence? How do we, you know, work together to prevent this and, you know, ultimately to respond to it? And, uh, and so, you know, as you might imagine, Tony Blinken, our secretary, our national security advisor, others, Secretary Austin, go out and start talking to allies and partners about it. And a lot of them were very skeptical, right? The just sort of a sense of, really? Like, this doesn't seem likely. Are you so sure? And as it came back, the president sort of said, well, we need the intelligence community to go out there. We need to start sharing intelligence to make sure that they see what we see so that they know that there's at least a basis for actually doing planning and responding to this. And so we began to sort of set those mechanisms up and, and really invest in them in a way that, you know, was sort of um, more than what I've at least seen before for this kind of effort. It was pretty extraordinary. And, you know, it was on a bilateral basis, different leaders in the intelligence community going out and talking to their interlocutors. It was teams of our analysts uh, and folks talking to experts in other intelligence community services and so on. And, uh, and we did it you know, to the international fora, to NATO, for example. I went there a number of times before even the invasion and, and afterwards. And, you know, and just sort of briefing them on what we're seeing and helping them to understand it. And even if they were skeptical, there was sort of a sense of this is serious. You know, we're actually providing some information and kind of changing their mind enough to say, we should plan with you on how to do this. And I think that did have a big impact. And I think to your final point, yeah, it, it is something that we're, because we sort of saw the structure and how to do this effectively, and also the value that we got from talking to our liaison partners about these issues and educating our own system, which of course we do naturally, but you know, doing it in this kind of concerted campaign was, you know, intensified it. Um, we're looking at, are there other ways we can do that? But we also are just, I'll put two things down as markers for I think some of the caution that we feel about moving forward on this. One is, you know, it's, um, we did it in a very deliberate way to try to protect sources and methods. That's obviously, you know, one of our greatest concerns. If we lose the access that allows us to have this insight, then we're really uh, undermining our entire capacity to promote the national security. So we want to make sure, and as we look to, many people ask about the China piece, like China, you know, any access that we have there, we need to protect. It's a long-term critical challenge for us. And so we need to be very careful about what we do in this space. The second is that we don't want to be perceived as a tool of policy. And I think, you know, in my own efforts to try to think about this, I wanted to make sure that there was still a separation between, you know, I didn't go to the North Atlantic Council, for example, with Tony to do a brief. I went separately and provided the intelligence community perspective. I had our senior analysts with us. You know, we let them say what they want. We're not clearing talking points with anybody, and we're providing our best assessment. And you know that, I think, is critical that we continue to have credibility, essentially, in this space if we're not perceived as basically holding policies water on this. And what, finally, on, on Russia, I want to ask you about Putin. We've seen the protests, which are remarkable, uh, especially since the call-up of the troops. But, do you see any real dissent among the military, among the elites, the oligarchs, in the power structure? I mean, we've seen increasing, essentially, dissent among the elites. And you know, you've seen mayors speak out. You've seen some of the sort of more significant figures in Russia um, you know, provide more critical views of the war and what's happening in Putin than you have in the past, but nothing that amounts to likely regime change, but it could shape some of his decision making. And I think that's the space that we frequently are kind of trying to understand better. How do you think the protests have shaped decision making? The protests in Russia? In Russia. I, I mean, I think the elite voices have probably had more to do to shape uh, potential um, Putin's decision making than the protests themselves. To harden his decision making? Unclear. Speaking of protests, Iran, yeah. extraordinary protests uh, that we really have never seen to this extent 
not in 2009, yeah. you know, even. Uh, to what extent do you think it will actually lead to change? Because the Iranian women whom I speak to, they believe there's no turning back. But it, yeah. the regime doesn't really seem to be movable. Yeah. It is, it, it is remarkable to see. And I mean, among the first protest movements that we've seen really be launched by a cultural issue that was just extraordinary. And I, yeah. So look, I think, you know, our, we're not seeing the regime perceive this as an imminent threat to their stability in effect, right? They're cracking down on what's happening. On the other hand, um, you know, when we look at how this is developing, when we look at it combined with the economy, for example, which really is having extraordinary challenges right now. I think they hit the early November an all-time low for the real, which was like 370,000 to a dollar. Um, you know, late November, I think we saw 50% inflation, 70% uh, food inflation. They are really having challenges and even nationwide seeing sporadic close downs of businesses and things like that. And I think, you know, from our perspective, that's one of those things that will lead to a greater risk of unrest and instability over time and, you know, depending on how it develops. And when you combine it with the generational divide that we're seeing that are represented in the protests and those pieces, I think, you know, we have yet to see how this ultimately evolves, but it is not something that we see right now as being a sort of, again, an imminent threat to uh, the regime. And we see the regime continuing to crack down on this pretty quite violently and you know that they are poised to do more, even as we see some uh, kind of controversies even within them about exactly how to respond within the government. Uh, to what extent are they using Chinese technology, uh, surveillance technology to track the protesters and to carry out punitive? Yeah, we see them doing a lot in the space of, in the information space to try to manage it, as we've seen, obviously, you know, Iran's efforts to influence our own politics and policy making. Iran is now enriching to just below weapons grade and uh, are t taking other steps at Fordo, which is obviously a lot harder to, uh, to track now that the inspectors are not functioning the way they have been and the cameras are shut off. Um, what is our red line here? Uh, well, th this is where I get lucky because I'm not in the policy community and I do not have that. Okay, yeah. uh, can, can, you, can you say how close they are to weaponizing and to miniaturizing? Uh, we, d we don't have information to suggest that they've made a decision to move towards a uh, nuclear weapon, but we continue to see them take moves, obviously. The US is spending millions of dollars a month to protect former officials from Iranian threats. Yeah. To what degree has the Revolutionary Guard uh, penetrated the U.S.? I know that pr protection and uh, action is a domestic issue, but what do we know about their ability to penetrate? I can't go into details about uh, the operational piece, but I will say that we continue to see the IRGC, the Quds Force, basically, and, and frankly, other Iranian intelligence services just continue to pursue increasingly aggressive actions, and you know, in part as a um, uh, in response to the Soleimani death, and you know, as a reprisal for that. But uh, but really, across the board, they are being extraordinarily aggressive going after both domestically and abroad dissidents and others. I want to ask you about North Korea. We saw the most advanced ICBM launch yeah. and the frequency of testing is extraordinary. We also saw Kim Jong-un bringing his nine-year-old daughter out yeah. and, uh, the, the first time to see a launch. It's quite a celebration, um, huh? Yeah. Uh, I, there's a lot of reporting that we're now expecting a nuclear test. What sense does, does the community have about how close we are to the first nuclear test in five years? I mean, it's certainly something that we're continuing to look at and monitor, and I think, you know, is not, uh, we've indicated that we expect to see additional tests, that a nuclear test is a possibility. Those are things that are gonna move forward. But as you point out, I think we're just seeing an extraordinary number in this year. I think it's been over 50 launches in this year alone. It's, it's pretty um, extraordinary. And, and there are a number of factors that go into that, right? I mean, I think in part, North Korea recognizes that China is, um, 
in a position where they're uh, less likely to essentially hold them accountable during this period, distracted by a variety of other things that we're in effect, uh, you know, focused on the Russia-Ukraine. They are potentially having more leverage with Russia to avoid being sanctioned by them, and it makes it much harder for Linda in the you know, and in the United Nations and in the UN Security Council to really get additional sanctions moving forward on them. And China. As you point out, China is now more concerned about its own issues, as well as perhaps seeing North Korea as less of a threat, a nuclear North Korea, than doing anything that would um, help America at a time like this. Yeah, they are certainly, as you say, distracted by domestic issues, and they have a lot on their plate right now. The Chinese protests, unprecedented. Yeah. Um, especially surprising to many observers after President Xi Jinping had just consolidated power. Yeah. Um, how significant do you think these protests are? I mean, I think, in a way, it's a different version of the Iran and the, um, really more of the probably Putin piece, which is to say that it's, again, not something we see as being a threat to stability at this moment, or, you know, regime change or anything like that, obviously. but. It is nevertheless something that we're watching quite carefully and, you know, again, can have an impact on decision making and how it develops will be important to Xi's standing. I mean, for one thing, it is um, highlighting the challenges that Xi finds himself in the context of his COVID policy, right? I mean, it has had a pretty negative impact on the economy in China. And yet it is also something that, you know, seeing protests and the response to it is countering, you know, the narrative that he likes to put forward, which is that he, you know, China is so much more effective at government, they're better at management, there's sort of no chaos here, we don't have these kinds of problems, right? And it also, I think, is highlighting the fact that despite the impact it's having on the economy, despite the human impact of the zero COVID policy on communities who, you know, are, are experiencing this in China, He's unwilling to take a better vaccine from the West and is instead relying on a vaccine in China that's just not nearly as effective against Omicron and the challenges that they're facing. And that's, a, I think, a challenge for him to manage. Uh, I know you can't talk about the investigation into Mar-a-Lago, Mar but uh, if somebody in the intelligence community took home documents, classified documents, and then resisted turning them back, what would be the impact? <laughs> Andrea. <laughs> yeah. Um, please don't do that. <laughs> Just leave it at that. I mean, two former directors of CIA had, had to pay uh, a price for that, or for something similar, for the way they handled intelligence. All right. Um, speaking of transparency, um, <laughs> nice. this, the survey of this foundation uh, had an historic low in terms of uh, the public's confidence in the intelligence community. Um, what do you attribute to that? Is that Iraq? Um, or is it the um, vilification of the so-called deep state by, you know, domestic uh, criticism, political criticism, unwarranted or, or, or otherwise. What, what do you think has caused this lack of confidence? Yeah, I, I think you're the survey that's sort of indicating that there's a lack of, or um, the trust in the military, not the intelligence community, but I, I do think that we also have a challenge with public trust in the intelligence community. And honestly, we've seen for years um, public trust deteriorating in public institutions more broadly. I, you know, this is something that is happening in the United States and also in Europe. And, um, and I take it very seriously for the intelligence community. I mean, I think coming in, it was one of, from my perspective, one of the key priorities is can we increase public trust in the intelligence community? And, and I see it, you know, as fundamental, frankly, to our mission, which is to say that when we have an opportunity to warn the public about you know, threats and challenges that we're facing as a country, 
I'm hoping that they will actually believe what we're saying, right? I mean, it, it, we're not going to be as effective as if they don't have trust in us. And we're also not going to get the best people coming to the intelligence community if they don't trust us. And, you know, so there's a variety of reasons for why I think it's critical for us to be building on that. And, and I'll just tell you, you know, some of the things that we're trying to do in order to enhance that. I mean, I, I think it's a series of things. One is, transparency on some level. And you know, for this, that's pretty hard, I would say. But it's nevertheless critically important for us to push on. And it's something that, I mean, look, I am part of a long tradition of leaders, frankly, trying to do this. And the areas that I'm focused on are trying to get out more on what we see as the threat in general ways if we can add to the conversation. I think that's important because I think in a democracy we want to have as educated a public conversation and debate as possible. And I believe national security and foreign policy is critically important and increasingly so. And so I want to contribute essentially what our analysts do. And we have a, a, an initiative where National Intelligence Council papers and others analytic products we're trying to pull out. But I also think it's critically important for us to be transparent about our programs and activities in very general ways that allow people to understand here are the lines around what we do and we don't do. And that's something that the more we can expose that, I think the better we are on just trying to help people understand this is something that I can't expect the intelligence community to do or this is something I can. And so therefore, when something comes out, you know, we're able to say this is what fit within this framework and here's why and hopefully, you know, people will understand that or here's where it didn't fit in the framework. And so therefore you need to hold us accountable for that. The other piece of it is that we continue to have mechanisms that try to oversee essentially our activities. And we report to Congress on a whole series of different programs where, you know, what is our compliance with those things? Where do we see issues, that sort of thing. And we try to increasingly publicize where we see non-compliance because I think that's part of helping to build trust. We are not doing everything perfectly. We understand that. We see problems too. We're gonna try to correct it. We do sometimes need space for people to say, okay, you're doing something, uh, you know, that is totally unacceptable, but, but okay, you've admitted to it, now let's actually fix it and get better and you know work on that. And then we are also doing things where we're trying to frankly help reflect the country in our intelligence community and a diversity of views and that, that is include re recruitment. Yeah. Women, women and minorities. Exactly. Like, so that means you know, a variety of things. That means trying to actually reflect from an ethnic and racial and you know, gender perspective uh, what America looks like in the intelligence community. But it also means getting out to diverse geographies. It means getting diverse viewpoints in the community. It means you know, we can't, for example, this sometimes comes up, we may produce something like on Oven, uh, origins of COVID or something like that. And we go out and we talk to a variety of experts on these issues. And many times scientists don't want to be seen as consulting with the intelligence community for a variety of reasons. And, uh, and so we can't always list here are all of the outside experts we go to, but we want to be able to show people that we have actually gone to a diverse set of views and that we actually have, you know, kind of educated folks who are consulting with us. And so we try to give as much transparency as we can on all those things. Sorry, that was probably too long. But, yeah, but uh, before I yeah. go, I wanted to ask you about any concerns you have about personal data and privacy with the explosion of TikTok, for instance and Chinese ownership. Yeah. Should parents be concerned about their kids being so you know, willing to use TikTok? <laughs> I'm probably not the best person to ask that question, but I, I, since I don't have kids, but I will tell you, like, I think you should be. <laughs> I am like, it's just, it, it is, um, it's extraordinary the degree to which China in particular, but they're not the only ones obviously, are you know, developing just ex frameworks for collecting foreign data and pulling it in and, uh, and their capacity to then turn that around and use it to target audiences for information campaigns or for other things, but also to have it for the future so that they can use it for a variety of means that they're interested in. And it is extraordinary how open we are as a society and the amount of information that we put into uh, you know, public venues that then can be accessed, but also through commercial means as well. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the terror threat. Is it being reconstituted in Afghanistan? 
And is, is there real danger of ISIS now? Uh, we understand that military operations have stopped in northern Syria against ISIS because of the Turkish attacks against the Kurds. So, you know, when I list sort of um, the key terrorist threats to the homeland and to U.S. persons, uh, the terrorist uh, threat from Yemen, from AQAP, is sort of right there at the top of the list. Al Shabaab in Somalia, in Mali, AQIM, and JNM, and those are sort of in the top three. And then you get to ISIS core in Iraq and Syria, and you get to ISIS K in Afghanistan. And those are really the ones that we're focused on, kind of in the top tier of of threats that we have to manage and monitor. And um, and in terms of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, you know, we're not seeing the capability being derived now in Afghanistan to be able to attack the United States. That doesn't mean that over time there may not be a threat, and that's something that we obviously have to continue to monitor, but that's not our top concern. ISIS-K is a concern, and, um, and that is one that we are working to ensure that it doesn't become more of a concern. And it's uh, largely focused, frankly, on the Taliban right now, and we're seeing the Taliban uh, attempt, but they really don't have the capability to go after it the way, obviously, we do. That is something that um, we'll continue to try to manage. And then, as you say, in Syria, I mean, this continues to be, obviously, a concern. And, and yes, prison breaking, other things, create more challenges for us in this space. But again, like this is something that it, we've seen, you know, two ISIS leaders go in the last year. It's, uh, it's a pretty um, dynamic environment and we're gonna continue to do everything we can to protect Americans on these issues and our allies and partners as well. Well, unfortunately my time is up. Um, we've oh, concluded, thank but thank you very much. Thanks for everything that you're doing and thanks for sharing with us. Thanks for inviting me.